60,000 people each year in the United States alone are diagnosed with Parkinson's disease. Michael J. Fox, Muhammad Ali are the two most public faces of the disease. You might recognize the tremors that characterize the disease. But there are smaller changes that aren't as easily seen, like a loss of smell, fainting spells, all signs of the neurological battle happening within the brain. In 1985, my next guest investigated a group of drug addicts that developed symptoms of Parkinson's after taking a bad dose of heroin. His documentary, The Case of the Frozen Addicts, was a case study in treatments for Parkinson's at that time. And now nearly 30 years later, after that documentary aired, he himself was diagnosed with Parkinson's disease. He now says it has become, quote, his journalistic beat to understand Parkinson's disease and find a cure. He describes that journey in his new book, Brainstorms. John Palferman is a science journalist, author of the new book, Brainstorms. John and I have known each other for years, and he joins us from WGBH in Boston. Welcome to Science Friday, John. Hello, Ira. Good to be here. How are you feeling? Pretty good so far. It's holding steady. I've had it about four years. But as you say, it was pretty ironic that of all the diseases that I get, it it would be Parkinson's, uh, a story that I'd worked on 25 years before. Mm. Tell Tell us how you discovered you had the disease. Well, I developed a tremor in my left hand, and I I didn't take it seriously. I thought my mother had a condition called essential tremor, which is benign, and I was convinced it was that. But I went to see a neurologist, and he diagnosed it as Parkinson's disease. And I I didn't react in a very sort of sophisticated way. I think initially I denied it and sought second opinions. I got pretty angry. Mm -hmm. I I tried to keep it secret for a while, just like Michael J. Fox did, and... It took me, I'd say, about a year before I really processed it properly, and then I realized that I had a destiny to use my training as a science journalist and my insights as a patient to explore this malady, which was now going to be part of my life. Mm. In your book, you describe having Parkinson's as a bit like going on vacation and driving on the wrong side of the road. How How has it affected your daily routine? Well, there's a part of the brain called the basal ganglia that does an awful lot of things automatically, so you don't have to think about it. And so I think it is very much like getting on a plane and going to London and renting a car. You can drive on the left-hand side of the road, but you have to use your conscious brain to to pay attention. Everything's a bit harder. Hmm. When I walk, I have to sort of consciously move my arms back and forth, whereas when a healthy person does it, it's automatic. And so a lot of things that you got for free, uh, you, you have to work at. Mm-hmm. Talking with uh, John Palferman, author of uh, Brainstorms, The Race to Unlock the Mysteries of Parkinson's Disease. If you'd like to talk about that disease, uh, have some anecdotes you'd like to share or, or a question, our number, 844-724-8255. And as always, you can tweet us at SciFry. Um John, in, in your documentary, The Case of the Frozen Addict, you profiled a, a neurologist, Bill Langston, that uh, looked at a compound called MPTP. What, uh, what did that discovery tell us about Parkinson's? Well, that was, that was a, a spontaneously discovered neurotoxin. The, the, the backstreet chemist who'd been trying to make a synthetic drug had, had botched his synthesis and created this toxin, which turned out to be incredibly useful for modeling the disease in animals so you could you could cause it now in primates and and test new drugs and this looked like a very promising avenue and as a result of it a whole series of strategies were were, were tried to to protect neurons dopamine neurons mainly to try and revive sick neurons and and in mo- most controversially to replace using neural grafts with fetal tissue um dead neurons for new ones but none of those strategies have really turned out to work very well. Mm. Do, do you view that time differently now as a patient? I see it differently as a patient, yes. I mean, there's no doubt that um, the, the journalist sees the story as, yeah. uh, in, as in terms of discovery, but the patient sees things in terms of survival. I thought, I thought it was very interesting in your book you, you, that Parkinson's was initially described as a movement disorder, but you write about the need to, to rebrand how we think about Parkinson's. I think that's right. I think what we classically think of Parkinson's, the tremor, the slowness, the rigidity, the stoop gait, is really the middle act of a three-act play. 
and that basically the disease is present maybe 10 or 15 years before a person gets diagnosed and producing, as you mentioned in your introduction, subtle things like loss of smell, constipation, maybe sleep disorders. And then um, the, the pathology moves on to the midbrain to create the, the movement part. And then after the person gets diagnosed, the disease continues in a third act and goes to affect other areas of the brain like the cortex which can produce cognitive impairment and hallucinations and things like that. So it's a much more systemic disease than it was once thought to be. But out of that concept has come a target because the idea is that the, the, the thing that's causing all the damage is now hypothesized to be a protein called alpha-synuclein which goes rogue and which forms sticky clumps called amyloids and they jump from cell to cell, killing cells in their wake. So there's a strategy at least now where we can attack this. Is is there are there tests going on to try to do that? Yes, there's there's, there's a whole series of compounds which are, if 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 alpha alpha synuclein is causing all the problems, then trying to reduce the levels of it makes perfect sense. And in the next year or two, going into clinical trials, there are a number of products which are designed to sort of dissolve alpha synuclein. And if they work, I mean the the prospects are amazing. But somebody who didn't have the disease, if you could get in early enough, would never develop the, part, the, the, the motor symptoms. And somebody like me who had the motor symptoms could possibly be stabilized so it didn't get any worse. So there's a lot of excitement at the moment around this. Uh, and you write in your book that uh, alpha synuclein uh, research gives you genuine hope. Do you, uh, Absolutely. Yeah. I mean, I, I, I think you've got, as a journalist, you've got to see that biomedical research moves very slowly. There's lots of things which give hope, which don't pan out. But, but this seems like a very good idea. And it's, it's been, for, for a couple of decades, people have been working on it, trying to get things. There's a company in Cambridge, Massachusetts, which is producing a product called, they're called Neurophage. And this, this product may potentially not just dissolve alpha-synuclein, but also the equivalent amyloids in other diseases like Alzheimer's and mm -hmm. Huntington's. So, so there's a lot of potential there. Did you go through what a lot of people go through when they're diagnosed with a disease? I'm going to try all the wacky ideas, too, the things that, you know, uh, the, that are on the fringe of medicine. No, I didn't. I, I think a lifetime of science, being a science journalist immunizes you against some of those things. Mm -hmm. No. So I... I th no, I didn't. So I didn't, and I'm sure you wouldn't have either if you had the same situation. Mm -hmm. L-dopa is the gold standard for Parkinson's treatment, uh, uh, but but you write that L-dopa therapy seems like a Faustian bargain. What 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 are the problems with L-dopa? Did you have to make that deal? Well, I think what's wonderful about L-dopa when when people first started using L-dopa, you can see um, old films from the '60s of it. They it, it's literally life restorative. They took people who couldn't move and let them move. But what happens is after a certain amount of time, it might be four years, five years, six years, seven years, eight years, you get what are, are called motor complications. You can get um, involuntary movements, which are called dyskinesias. Everybody's seen Michael mm -hmm. J. Fox. He, he, he can talk, but he can't control his movements all the time. And other, other things that happen is that the medication can switch off suddenly and fluctuate. And so it's, it's a Faustian bargain, but it's not one you can really afford to turn down because, because there's nothing really like levodopa. Before levodopa came along, patients with Parkinson's lived an average of six or seven years, and now, now they survive 20, 25, 30 years. So it's, mm -hmm. a, it's night and day. Uh, and Oliver Sacks, of course, made it famous in, in the movie that was made about him and in his writings before then. Um, when you were diagnosed and you, you knew Oliver's history of research with it, did you have any feelings about contacting him? And yes, I've known Oliver for a long time, and he's a I remarkable I figured you man. would, yeah. And he's, his, his, his group of patients who had the, a type of encephalitis lethargicus, it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a special type of Parkinsonism. Um, they, got, they got better with that L-dopa, but then immediately afterwards they got these terrible side effects which can include hallucinations and, and horrible things like that. Mm. But basically, for, for most patients, it's, it's, it's a positive good. And why does it stop working? Well, it doesn't, it doesn't really stop working. Um, what, what you've got to remember is that the, the disease is progressing, so there are fewer and fewer dopamine neurons for it to work on. Mm. And after a time, 
the L-dopa, L-dopa sort of slips into the brain because it can pass through the blood-brain barrier. And then it needs to find a cell which can turn it into dopamine, which is the chemical you need. And I think some of the work is being done by other, other neurons, like serotonin neurons. They're doing the work, but they're not, they're not designed to do it, so they, they just splurt it out. And so mm-hmm. I think you're not getting the, the same experience of a, of, a, of a genuine live neuron with dopamine neuron. You're getting something that's pretty good, but not perfect. And that's where the complications come in, I think. Mm-hmm. Let me see if I can get a quick call in before a break. Uh, let me, let's go to Birmingham, Alabama. Pam, welcome to Science Friday. Hi, thank you. My question um, has to do with crack cocaine. And a friend of mine had Parkinson's. Um, He'd had it for maybe 10 years. It was a slow progression. And um, he got into crack cocaine, and because it gives you a flush of dopamine, I'm just wondering if um, that could have had anything to do with the addiction. I don't know about that, but there's a class of drugs called dopamine agonists, which which have, have led to compulsive behavior. And basically, you, you may know this, Ira, this story that between 10 and 15 percent of people who take dopamine agonists develop pathologies of gambling and sex addiction, which mm-hmm. is quite remarkable. Dopamine is a, a reward center of the brain, so it's a, it's, it's, it's a very kind of critical system in the brain, and, and strange things happen. But these people who have the, have the compulsions, if they stop the drug, the, the compulsions go away. Mm-hmm. Let's go to uh, Maggie in uh, Beaufort, uh, South Carolina. Hi, Maggie. Hi. Thank you so much for having me. It's actually Beaufort, but we're way deep in the South, so don't worry about the pronunciation. <laughs> My apologies. <laughs> no, no worries. So I quit smoking about two years ago and was promptly diagnosed two weeks, actually, after um, with severe essential tremors. And I'm a writer and um, a professor, so that's kind of a problem. <laughs> um, so not being able to write becomes difficult. So in any case, I, I went through the course of you know, the various things they get, try to give you for it, um, none of which, of course, are designed for essential tremors, and they make very clear the d- differentiation between Parkinson's and ET. Um, except for that, those boundaries seem to be really, really blurry. And I was unable to take any of the pharmaceuticals. I mean, I'm the 1% as far as side effects go for everything. Um, so you were discussing that, and I just, first of all, wanted sympathy in that. But second, <laughs> any, any thoughts you have? I mean, here's, here's, I'm asking essentially for resources. I'm on a whole bunch of message boards for ET. And there's a lot of people who just offer great advice. Um, we're all just, you know, muddling through it as best we can. Um, and then there's no certain certainty in anything but um, I guess I, I guess I have a question and just an observation and that is that a lot of the information comes just from the front lines right what does work what doesn't work and that we're all muddling through but um, any anything you want to add hmm. about the uncertainty I guess let me let me just let me remind everybody that this is science Friday from PRI public radio right. international that's to help pay the bills. <laughs> well, John Palferman, author of uh, Brainstorms. John, what, what is a good general source for people who have questions about Parkinson's or tremors? Well, essential, essential tremors is a different thing. It's not neurodegenerative, so your essential tremors shouldn't get any worse, which is very good news. But, but as for strategies, they're, 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 they're not, to my knowledge, any specific drugs. I mean, some of the surgical interventions like deep brain stimulation might work pretty well for essential tremor if you were ready to go that route. Mm-hmm. How, how disabling is your essential tremor? Yeah, Can you not she's, type with it? She's, she's, she's dropped off the phone, so uh, she'll, okay. she, she'll hear what you have to say. But um, uh, Do you hear this a lot now that you've written the book, uh, people asking for all kinds of advice? Yes, yes you, do. you do, I mean, uh, uh, which I think indicates that people are kind of lost. And whether it's cancer or whether it's Parkinson's or whether it's Alzheimer's, when you get a diagnosis, you're your life changes and you you seek out people. And one of the great things about the Parkinson's community is that it's full of people with great advice. There's a there's a, a ballet dancer, Pam Pamela Quinn, who lives in New York, who teaches Parkinson patients how to trick their bodies, how to move using her bodily wisdom. And there's all kinds of folk mm. knowledge uh, which, which help you on a day-to-day basis. Do you, can you retrain your different parts of your body? 
Yes, you can. I mean, exercise, the, the one thing which really everybody should do is regular exercise because people who do exercise and stay mobile, they, they do much, much, much better than people who withdraw and give up. You, you know, because you, you've, you've still got the conscious part of your brain. You can, still, you can still drive like you're driving in London on the wrong side of the road. It's just, it just takes a bit more energy and effort, but, but, it, but it still works. Mm-hmm. And you, you talked about the research you're waiting to hear about. Uh, is, are, there, are there more pressing questions for scientists working on a cure for Parkinson's that you've discovered? Well, I, I think, I think there's, you can divide cures into sort of disease modifying, which is what I was talking about before, things that actually interfere with the progress of the disease and, and things which deal with the, treating the symptoms. And even though levodopa was discovered 50 years ago, there hasn't been, in my view, very good research to find better ways to deliver it. If it, if it was possible to deliver it more continuously, you'd get a better result. I think also that deep brain stimulation, um, which has been a bit of a hit and a miss, hit or miss thing up until now, is, is, is poised to become much more sophisticated. I think in the future, just like we have very sophisticated heart pacemakers, we might get a situation where I've got a, an electrode in my brain and just before my, my left hand wants to set off a tremor, um, mm-hmm. it, uh, it sets off a pulse and reboots that part of the brain and, and mm-hmm. cures it. So I, I'm, I think I think these things look pretty promising so that even if you haven't got a, a total cure, the management of the thing will become much better and we'll be able to live pretty much essentially normal lives. Mm-hmm. And uh, John Palfelman, I want to thank you for, uh, for writing the book and taking time to be with us today on Science well, nice Friday. To, nice to talk to you again, Ira. You too. John Palfelman, science journalist, author of the new book, uh, Brainstorms. Excellent book if you were looking for uh, some information on Parkinson's. It's just a good read about uh, John Palfelman's experience.